So now, this is our first lecture in Chapter 12 on thermal radiation. Uh, we are introduced to the processes and properties of thermal radiation. Chapter 13, the next chapter, is really an engineering uh, approach to problem solving for radiation problems. Um, if you thought this class was hard, it just went up a notch. I hate to say it, but thermal radiation is mathematically challenging. I think you'll agree after today's lecture. Um, so let's just jump into it. So you go back and review a little bit about electromagnetic radiation. You think about photons and waves. You can think about photons as being individual packets of energy, light energy, typically the way it's introduced, or it's in general electromagnetic, or a continuous stream of, uh, uh, described by the wavelength, so that dual nature in order to describe electromagnetic radiation. Well, in this class, we're interested in thermal radiation. What is that part of the spectrum that plays uh, a big role in transferring heat, heat transfer? And the electromagnetic spectrum uh, goes for a long way, and uh, you typically, engineers like to talk about it, not in terms of frequency, but in terms of wavelength. And the wavelength is measured in, what is that, microns, 10 to the minus 6 meters. And they'll put on there something like oh, 10 to the minus 1, uh, 10 to the 0, 10 to the plus 1, 10 to the plus 2, 10 to the plus 3. 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 3, etc. As we've sketched it, is that x-axis uh, linear or log scale? It's a log scale. And so there's a large range of electromagnetic radiation. Well, thermal radiation comes in between 0.1 and 100 microns. That's just where it's active. Now, it's not like a hard line, but it's in the general rule between 0.1 and uh, 100 is the range of the wavelengths of interest for thermal radiation. Well, we have thermal, we have radiation, but it's like x-rays or gamma rays where they're much shorter in wavelength. Or you have longer, would be like radio waves, other electromagnetic radiation, much longer wavelengths. But this is the active region. In that uh, active region, um, there is a region of the visible spectrum. And that visible spectrum is like right in here, visible. And it's visible to what the eye can see. And so the eye can see between a wavelength of about 0.7, point something, 6.5-ish, depending, uh, down to about 0.4 little bit lower maybe, so 0 .4, 0 0.4 to 0.7 microns. And there's a mnemonic, which is a helpful little list of letters that you may have learned before to help put the colors of the spectrum in order. And the way we've written it, it would be Roy, spelled backwards, G, Biv. Roy G. Biv. I always like to do a show of hands. Who've, who's heard of Roy G. Biv? That's actually very good. That's a very high percentage. So red, orange, yellow in the middle is green. And then blue, indigo, violet. And so the red has a longer wavelength and the violet's a shorter wavelength. What's the relationship between the speed of light the frequency of the electromagnetic radiation and the wavelength of the radiation. You recall that uh, the speed of light is equal to lambda times nu. So how many people can remember the magnitude of the speed of light in a vacuum? 2.9998 times 10 to the eighth meters per second, or round it off 3 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. It's in a vacuum. Does light, when you put it into another material like glass or a gas, does it speed up or slow down? It'll actually slow down a little bit. 
it's, it's in a vacuum, that's the fastest it gets. All right, and then this is the frequency um, of inverse hertz. So the energy associated with that electromagnetic packet or photon is can be described as H times C divided by lambda. And this is Planck's constant right here. I forgot to point out here is the speed of light. In, uh, two, I guess I put in too many nines, didn't I? It's just 2.998. All right, instead of I think I put too many nines in when I said it verbally uh, for the speed of light in the vacuum. Okay, so this is Planck's constant. This is the speed of light, and it's proportional to 1 over the wavelength. So the main takeaway for this is when you have a short wavelength down in here, this isn't this short wavelength uh, in this region right in here. It's short wavelength. And what about the energy content of those photons? High energy. All right. So when you go out and you're in the sun and the photons from the sun are beating down on your skin, um, do you get burned? because of the long wavelength part of the, nah, it's that short wavelength high energy. So they split this, uh, on this side of the visible is the IR, and on this side is the UV part of the spectrum. What does the IR stand for? Infrared, yeah. And they have both the long, wavelength infrared as well as the short wavelength infrared. Okay. And as the object gets hotter, you will emit more in the shorter wavelength infrared and then it can bleed into the visible region. We'll talk about that. And then the UV stands for ultraviolet. Notice the V for the violet at the end of Roy G. Biv and the red infrared to help tie things together in the visible spectrum. So there's a lot of background material um, that you have already been exposed to uh, associated with light, electromagnetic waves, etc. All right. Well, first of all, we'll review something that you should all be familiar with, and that's two-dimensional angles two-dimensional space, an XY plane, you have an angle, all right. Um, so if I have an XY plane and I take maybe a line segment and I take that line segment and I rotate it to this, so I keep the one point at the origin, I just rotated through an angle theta. What's the relationship between theta this distance r, which doesn't change, it's, does, it's not elongating, it's still r, that line that's rotated, it's pivot at this point, and that length of the arc. What is that relationship? Theta is equal to arc length divided by that radius, yeah. And uh, somebody says this comes in, I don't know, 0.15. Okay, what are the units on this angle? Let's say theta is equal to 0.15. I'm making that up. It's in units of radian. And that's the units. Uh, somebody says, uh, is, is a radian like a meter per second? Is a radian like a meter squared per second? What is a radian in? It's actually dimensionless. It's arc length over length. It's, it's dimensionless, but we would talk about it being the measure of that two-dimensional angle. Okay. Well, we're going to talk about 3D and directional characteristics of radiation. Well, in 3D, you can have a coordinate system and you can have a constant uh, rod that's at the origin, and then you can move that rod around, and it can trace out a little, not a length, but an area, a little area at the end of that rod. And you can think about 
the cone. It's not tootie anymore. It's a little cone that goes out. And we would talk about the solid angle, omega, equal to the ratio of something divided by R. R, okay, well, what is it? What are we tracing at the end of that? An area, just like we had a length. But if we do it this way, uh, it's insufficient to divide only by R, because what are the SI units of area? Meter squared? What would that give us for a solid angle, something with length? So you divide by the arc length squared. Does that make sense? So you could talk about the solid angle uh, omega, and it's the ratio of the area at the end of that cone divided by the length squared. All right. Hmm. I'm going to get to this. But uh, somebody says, this is in review again, in my XY coordinate system, I'm going to take that line that starts here, and I'm going to rotate it to here. And they say, what is that angle theta? And I rotated it 90 degrees, but I want it in radians. What is that angle? Pi over 2. That's right. Somebody says, okay, that's too easy. We're going to make it harder on them. Take that and we're going to rotate it all the way around. And so the angle theta is pi. OK, what is the equivalent of this case in 3D? In 3D. So I know it's hard to draw in 3D, but sort of the, the x, the y, the z. And what you're going to do is you're going to move it around until you have encased half of a sphere, half of a sphere, right? So what is the solid angle um, for the hemisphere? The hemisphere is uh, half of the sphere, the top part. It's like my little area down here is going to be shooting off photons, and they're going to go up somewhere into the hemisphere above it. It could go at this angle or straight up or over this angle. So that's the application that we're getting to. So in 3D, the solid angle for a hemisphere is going to be that area for the hemisphere divided by that distance, a constant r, squared. All right, so this is a memory thing. Uh, is the area 4 pi r squared, or is the area pi r squared, or is the area 4 thirds pi r squared, or cubed, sorry, or is the area equal to 4 6 pi r cubed? Two of them have the wrong units because it's r cubed. Somebody looks at this and says, you know what? That's not the area. That's the volume, 4 thirds pi r cubed. Isn't that the volume of a whole sphere? And then somebody looks at this. You said 4 divided by uh, 3, and then you multiply it by 2. Oh, you just cut that in half, didn't you? So you just took the volume of a sphere and cut it in half. So this is, I can see what you're trying to do here, but that's wrong, and that both are wrong, right? The third one is the volume of a sphere. The second one's the volume of half of a sphere. Which one of these is right, A or B? Not a clicker question. Who's... Uh, did I mess that up? What do I need right here? A two? I left off the two. I didn't intend to leave off the two, but I did. Okay, sorry about that. So you remember maybe 4 pi r squared is the area, and then I cut it in half for the hemisphere. So if I replace it, what is the solid angle? associated with the whole hemisphere, everything above, it would be the 4 pi r squared. Whoops, I did it again. It's a 2 pi r squared, right? Divided by r squared, cancel the r squared. 2 pi is the solid angle associated with sketching out the hemisphere. Just like 1 pi, radian is for the half arc of a, of a circle. This would be in radians, 
This would be in SRs. I forgot. What is SR again? Stair radian. Stair radian versus radian. Okay. All right, let's press forward. Let's review a little mathematics. So if I put in here my traditional x, y, z, and my surface is going to be in the x, y plane, and I'm interested in photons going into the upper hemisphere, then I probably want to talk about a distance r and an angle phi and an angle theta. Uh, this is just reviewing a spherical coordinate system. So I, I start maybe down here at the origin. If I go up with a straight line of length r, sometimes people will use rho for that. R or rho, but it's that length. And then we have the projection of that line down into the xy plane. And then we have an angle coming out, that angle coming from the positive x down over an xy plane to that projection. That's one of the angles. The other is from the z over to that line. That's the other angle. Okay. The way I learned the spherical coordinate systems is that I learned that it was theta and phi. How many people, that looks really good. Ah, that's right. Well, guess what? That is just another area of confusion. I'm trying to help you here. That is M-A-T-H. So if you go to the math class, that's the way I learned it. But in this textbook, they switched it. And they use phi for the angle in the xy plane, and they use theta for the angle associated with the z axis. So, this is the heat transfer textbook. This is the heat transfer textbook. Why? Well, because we're going to talk about cosine distributed uh, radiation, where there's really, if you're going to have any preference, it's going to be primarily with the z axis, not with the with the theta, it, it's not with the x axis in the rev revolution. So that's why. So, uh, sorry about that. Just another thing to be aware of. So, um, somebody says, if I take and I don't change r, but I change Phi, no, okay, forget it. Let me, let's get rid of this so we're going to know. We're not talking about that, and we're not talking about this. So if I change phi and leave r, what a little change in phi, doesn't that make a little arc up here? And what will be the length of that line, that little arc, not changing theta, just changing phi? And then what we're going to do is we're going to get another arc right here by changing theta. And the product of those two little arcs give me a little dA, a little area. All right. So um, let's do the red one first. What, what, what is that going to be? What is the length of that? Well, let me do this. What is the length of, of uh, this line right here? And I come up here and I go back. Isn't that the same line? And I have a right triangle with respect to the z-axis. They're supposed to be parallel. I didn't make them look too parallel, did I? Okay, now, now that I know that that's a right triangle, then I know that the length going from the z-axis over to this point is r times either the sine of... Uh, of theta or the cosine of theta? Sine of theta. Isn't that this length right from here to here? And then if I move d phi, doesn't that give me an arc? Hey, this is a review, right? Remember this? Okay, and then how about this other one going this way? Uh, that arc is going to be this r times d theta, r d theta. And when I multiply those two little lengths, I have a little dA. So dA, the surface area, is r squared 
sine of theta d phi d theta. Professor, why didn't you just say so? Well, okay, great. It's a review. And I know I've the book changed the angles, so it's a little tricky for me to, to keep them straight, too. This is a theta. Let's go back and practice a little math. Let's, uh, let's say that I want to uh, calculate the total area of a hemisphere. All right, well, I would just sum up all the little DAs over the hemisphere. Well, if I'm going to sum up all the little da's, I would replace that by an r squared sine of theta d phi. Well, let's put theta first. d theta, then on the outside, d phi. All right. So I'm going to have two integrals. The inner integral is theta, and the outer is phi. And they're, they're defined as shown in the sketch. And I'm going to say that I'm going to give you the lower limit of both of them. They both start at zero. So theta is zero, okay, up there at the z-axis. And then what I want you to do is to give me the correct upper limits, both of the theta integral and of the phi integral, for this hemispherical integration. All right, so write it down on your piece of paper. I'm going to walk around and check it. All right, very good. Let's pick it up here. So with respect to this is theta. Sorry if it doesn't look that good. That's right here. It's going to start at zero and go all the way down until it hits the xy plane, which is pi divided by 2. If you were asked to do it for the whole sphere, it would go 0 to pi. And some people were giving me 0 to pi, but it's only for the hemisphere, 0 to pi over 2. And then phi goes all the way around till it gets back to the positive x direction, so it's uh, 2 pi. Let's, because I'm doing only half of the sphere, hemisphere, hemi, half of the sphere. If I went all the way down, I would catch too much. It would do the lower half. Um, this V, right, goes, let me see if I could draw it all the way around. And this from up here goes halfway down. Does that help? Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and uh, do this integral. So the R squared comes outside. That's easy. And uh, we have to do the integral of sine of theta d theta. What's that? What's the integral of sine of theta d theta? Theta. And then we'll evaluate 0 to pi over 2. And then we'll finish that with the integral of 0 to 2 pi d phi. All right. So this inner integral is what does this one work out to be? It'll be negative a cosine of pi over 2, pi, cosine of pi over 2. So it'll be negative of the cosine of pi over 2 minus the cosine of 0. And then I'll finish out d phi, integral 0 to 2 pi r squared. Okay, so what is the cosine of this right here, pi over 2? 0. And then this one? One, but you have a negative of a negative one, so it's the integrand is kind of blase. It's just, it's just one. And so then we're going to have uh, r squared times one, times and then integral from zero to two pi of one d phi. That's just two pi. Okay. So uh, does that match what we had before, Professor? I thought we had it's a four pi r squared. Ah, the whole, whole area of the whole sphere. Here we're doing it for the hemisphere. This is half a sphere, so we divide by 2, right? And we get 2 pi r squared. Does this agree? Yeah, 2 pi r squared. Great, we just went in a nice loop and built up our confidence. Very good. Let's continue on. 
Oh, I don't have clickers today, but how many radians are in a half circle arc? Half a circle arc. How many radians? Pi. How many stair radians in a half a sphere, a hemisphere? Two pi. Isn't it interesting that pi can be used for radians as well as stair radians? for planar angles as well as solid angles, in 2D problems as well as 3D problems, interdimensionalists in all cases. It's a ratio of length to length or area to length squared. All right. Well, we're going to get to something a little more intense uh, mathematically. We're going to introduce the radiation intensity, I. And uh, we're going to use it talk about emission, the radiation being emitted from a surface, as well as the irradiation impinging on the surface, as well as even the radiosity, which is the net outgoing. But at this point, I'm going to skip and skip, and we're just going to focus on this equation. But you can see the parallelism. You, you have something times is equal to pi times this i this I. And that I with the subscript E for emission, subscript I for irradiation, or E plus R, which is emission plus reflection for this I. But this I stands for radiation intensity. All right, well, before I try to understand this equation and explain what I is, let me see if I can break it down in, in the in the hopes of being able to explain I in this equation, I want to first focus on one of the other two terms, either the pi or the E. All right. Which one do you think is a little easier to focus on? The pi. All right. What do you think that pi stands for? A magnitude of the solid angle in stair radians that just happens to be pi. It's not 2 pi. It's not half pi. It's not 4 pi. It's just pi. But it's a, it's a solid angle in measure of a stair radian. True? Okay. Now, the next one that maybe we can get a handle on. What is this E? It's, here's a little hint right here in this equation. It's associated with emission. Somebody says, E, E, I think I learned something like that in the first or second lecture of this class, way back in chapter one, where they introduced uh, radiation. E stood for, yeah, it's like an emissive power. So this would be the emissive power. Okay, give me some uh, typical units, SI units. Uh, watts per meter squared. Somebody says, I think I even know how to calculate that. I think, it, isn't it related to sigma times t to the fourth from somebody's law? That hyphenated Stefan Boltzmann law? Yeah, that's what we're talking about. I didn't put a lot of subscripts on this. I want to keep it simple, but yeah, isn't it? And so that's our emission for black surface and strength. So now we can tackle this one. Well, its name is intensity. And when I have a subscript, it's the emissive intensity. But let's just take a look at the units that it has to be. This is funny. Watts per hmm, meter squared per stair radian. Now, there's a little something that I may do is I may put a little n on that meter squared. And the book doesn't really do it. If I come over here and I said, what is this meter squared here? You would say, well, how big is your area? And that's the, the area. You're, it's, it's your watts per meter squared of that area that's coming off, being emitted from that area. Well, why would I put an N on this for the intensity? What, what could it be? What, what could that N stand for? 
That's right. It's normal or projected. Normal or projected surface. So if somebody says, uh, I'm, I'm, my, I'm looking from here, I'm looking straight down at my surface, I'm, I'm looking straight down at it, it looks like the full area. But if I'm looking from a shallow, if I'm looking from an angle theta, which is getting close to pi over 2, if I look at that area, the projection of it isn't as big as if I was looking straight down. And so that area gets smaller as the theta gets larger. It's a one-to-one -one if theta is straight zero, straight down. So it's a, a normal per projected area. All right, let's press forward with that derivation. What are we going to derive? We're going to derive this equation right here. How many pages will it take? Oh, two pages. Do you think that the average student will get lost? Absolutely not. Let's move on. Let's just go for it. So I know that I'm trying to follow the derivation in the textbook. They put in not only I sub E, but they also put in I lambda comma E, another subscript. What's that additional subscript for? It's for the wavelength. So it's not only emission, but it's emission per wavelength per emitting area normal to that direction in which it's being emitted. And it's also per solid angle in the direction. So look at these units. I think if you can get the units of it, it would be watts per meter squared. But that meter squared is the projected or normal area. And what is this mu sub m? I've never seen that before. What is this term? Yeah, that's, it's microns. It's the wavelength per wavelength. You could then integrate over all the wavelengths. We'll get to that. And then SR, I forgot, what is that? Steradium. Now, for a diffuse surface, this is our happy surface. This is the surface you want to see. This is the non-complicated surface. This is the easiest surface we can work with. And oh, by the way, most engineering approximations say we're going to only deal with diffuse surfaces. For a diffuse surface, this term, I forgot what it is, the intensity as a emissive intensity, which is a, a function of the wavelength, okay? So we'll call that like the spectral function of wavelength, emissive intensity, okay? That is not a function of direction. It's not a function of phi or theta. So they'll plot it. And if you look at figure 12.2 in the textbook, they'll show, oh, here is I lambda sub E. This is the normal direction. This would be a 2D representation, theta coming down, but it's not a function of theta. It's just uniform, regardless of theta. Okay, let's continue up here now. So for a small emitting surface, the area that's normal to the direction of emission is going to depend on that angle in which it's being emitted. It's the cosine of that angle. Think of looking back. That size of the area would be dA times the cosine of theta. If theta is equal to zero, cosine of theta, uh, cosine of zero is one, it's the whole area. But as theta gets closer and closer to pi over two, it, it, you're just, it looks like that area diminishes. All right, so let's put that into the equation. So we say this is the amount of energy being emitted per wavelength which is given by the spectral emissive intensity times that normal area times the solid angle in that area, in that direction. So the, the, what, the reason we have, uh, it's the small amount, it's per this area as well as per the, uh, per the solid angle. So this, we can take that area, move it over to the other side, and we now we're talking about a spectral radiative flux and we're left with this blue term that I pay particular attention to it's that cosine of theta term all right so here are the units watts per meter squared per micron all right and this is what's coming out it's like an emissive flux and notice figure 12.4 they'll plot this and they'll say oh this has a shape that starts with the unity and then as theta gets larger, it drops off to zero. It's like tucking it in right there. Compare figure 
12.2 and figure 12.4. They look very different, but you know what? One is plotting an intensity, and one is pl plotting the um, emissive flux. And that emissive flux is what they say is cosine distributed. And where's the cosine come from? Right there. All right, let's press forward. So the book uh, drops off the notation per unit area, and but but this term has watts per meter squared. It is a, still a flux term. And so you have this intensity, the spectral emissive intensity, the cosine of theta, the omega. And what are you going to do? You're going to integrate over all of the solid angle for the hemisphere. Hey, you know what? You guys just worked that out, didn't you? You integrate the solid angle, d omega, is sine of theta, d theta, d phi. Theta is going to go from 0 to pi over 2. Phi is going to go from 0 to 2 pi for the hemisphere. Not bad. Now I just have to remember, uh-oh, not only <laughs> I got to do this one, what's the integral of the cosine of theta, sine of theta, d theta? Ooh, ooh, I saw some grimaces out there. I looked at your face and you said, ooh, 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 not so good. Well, anyway, uh, let's do this. If you do this inner integral right here, it turns out to be negative one-half cosine squared of theta. How would you check that this is the right integral? Differentiate it, see if you get back cosine of theta times sine of theta, right? In the case, you apply the limits to that, and you pick up the one-half. Then you integrate with respect to phi. You pick up the two. Guess what happens? Uh, two pi. Guess what happens to the twos? They cancel and you're left with the spectral emissive power is equal to pi stair radian times the spectral emissive intensity for a diffuse surface. That's where we wanted to get to. First time you see this, and you kind of skimming through the book at the derivation, you say, the book has a typo, there's a missing two. Why? Because there's two pi stair radians in the hemisphere. But, it's not a typo, and it is only pi. Does that mean, isn't that pi the, like stair radians? Yep, sure is. So anyway, I leave it there for you. We're going to pick up there and use that even more next time. So for a diffuse surface, the spectral emissive intensity is uniform. It's plotted like this. As well as for a diffuse surface, sometimes they'll plot it like this. You look, oh, these look very different. Well, what are we plotting? We're plotting the spectral emissive flux, and they'll say it's cosine distributed. So either we're plotting I, or we're plotting I times the cosine of theta, which is E. They have so similar of units. They have watts per meter squared, micron, steradian. It's just that one of the area is normal uh, to the direction uh, for the areas. Well, now we're going to shift a little bit, and we're going to come back, and we're going to make use of that equation, but not in this lecture. We'll make use of it when we get to view factors. But uh, we'll talk a little bit about a perfect thermal emitter, as well as the, if it's a perfect thermal emitter, it's also a perfect absorber, and that's black body. So. Things that are black, a lot of times when we get more familiar with the terms, it's emissivity approaches one. It, 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 it emits with the Stefan-Boltzmann law, not a fraction of the Stefan-Boltzmann law. Remember we had a modified Stefan-Boltzmann law? Okay. So it absorbs all the incident radiation regardless of wavelength and direction. It emits the maximum thermal radiation regardless of the wavelength or direction and it's a diffuse emitter, so that intensity is um, uniform, and it's cosine distributed on the intensity, or the radiation. The radiative emissive flux is cosine distributed. All right, <clears throat> well, now we move into something that makes the previous math look easy, child's play. Now we're going to move into a little more challenging area. 
Well, uh, somebody named Planck a long time ago worked out a very simple packaged equation that describes the actual emission for a black body as a function of the wavelength at the given temperature of the black body. They knew that as the temperature of the surface went up, it was a much stronger emitter. You can go back and you can just say the EB is equal to sigma T to the fourth. As T goes up, that power of four really kicks in and it's putting out a lot of watts per unit area. Well, this equation right here is Planck's equation or Planck's distribution. And it's plotted over here on this axis. So let's take a look at this plot. What we have on the x-axis is wavelength. Look at the units on the wavelength, micron. What is the minimum x-axis plotted? 0.1. What is the maximum? 100. What did he just say about the range of thermal radiation? 0.1 to 100 microns. Okay, so this is the range of thermal radiation. Uh, look at, is this plotted on a linear scale or a log scale for the x-axis? It's log. It's log. So it's kind of squished over, right? It's zoomed in on the left and a bunch is squished in on the right. Um, you know, because between what this one, which is 60 and 100, that's not a much distance. But point 0.1 and point 0.2, there's a lot of distance uh, in the x. Okay, this, so that's the, the uh, x-axis. What's on the y-axis? This is my spectral emissive power and E lambda b. Hey, that's what this is. I'm plotting that equation. That's what the book is doing. And it has units of watts per meter squared per micron. Okay, let's take a look. What's the minimum value on the y-axis? 10 to the minus 4. That's pretty small. What's the maximum value? 10 to the plus 9. What is, it's, it's a log scale. How much variation is there on the y-axis? This is one of those cases where the word huge really does come into play. It is phenomenal. It is a huge variation from really, really small to really, really large, okay? You look in all your other engineering textbooks. Go look in your solids book. Go look in your fluids book. Go look in all the other books and say, can I find something that has a change on one axis of 13 orders of magnitude? 13. You probably can't find it. It's a, quite a large range. All right, now that we have our axes put in this perspective, what did they do for, they picked a particular temperature, they picked a T, that's the only place this comes into this equation, and they plotted as a function of lambda, that curve. And so if they picked a value of 300, what does the curve look like? Isn't it like this? Okay, what's significant about 300 Kelvin? Room temperature. Did you know that every surface is emitting some photons? And this room, you know, plastic, paper, walls, and all that, it's around 300 Kelvin, and it's emitting photons. You know it's emitting the most photons that are in, let's say, the 10 micron range. And because this is a log scale, what I can do is I can drop an order of magnitude, come across and cut, and from here to here is primarily all the thermal radiation for a 300 Kelvin surface. It's between about 4 microns and 40 microns. That's the majority, vast majority of the thermal radiation happening in this room. That's the range. Okay. Somebody says there's a really hot uh, kitchen stove and uh, the little coil on the kitchen stove has been left on, no pots on there, and it's gotten red hot, right? You don't want to touch it. It's red hot. I know when you were little, you were really enthralled. You saw that in the kitchen. You just, oh, that's so cool. Let me go up there and touch it. And your mom slapped your hand or your dad or somebody yanked you away from the stove. Yeah, because I remember trying to go up and touch that red hot stove. What is that? It's so cool. But anyway. So if you get something really hot, let's say you're up at this temperature, 2,000 Kelvin, just to grab one. 
it's starting to push photons into the visible region enough that you can actually see it with your eyes and it's going to remember Roy G. Biv. Red is it's going to glow red first because that's predominantly the photons that are coming out, that 0.7-ish micron photons. Now, at 2000, it's putting out still a lot in the IR infrared, short wavelength infrared. And so I would say it's primarily putting out at around, I don't know, one point something micron. Drop down, order magnitude, cut across. And it's putting out maybe right in the middle of the visible spectrum, 0 0.5, 0 0.6 micron, out to maybe 6 micron if surface is at 3,000 or 2,000 Kelvin. Now they put one, what's the maximum temperature they plot up here? Well, they plot something that's uh, 5,800 Kelvin. Why'd they pick that? Uh, solar radiation. That's kind of the surface temperature of the sun and the photons are being pumped out at that surface temperature, effective surface temperature of the sun. And you can tell where is the peak, right in the middle of the visible spectrum. It's a little south or close to green, right in the middle, Roy G. Biv, green right in the middle. And it, it, it pretty well covered it. Now, I know we're not supposed to look at the sun, but if uh, you tell the light from the sun, is it red or is it white? It's white. It does so you go Roy G. Biv. Where was the W in that one? Roy, Roy, red, orange, yellow. Well, white is basically a broad spectrum of uniform intensity uh, wavelengths. And so it's white. Okay. Now I always ask this question. A lot of us have seen red hot. The kitchen stove is easy to see. You see it all the time. Has anybody seen white hot? One, two. Where'd you see white hot? Not the sun, some other application, another application. You have? Yeah, like oh, something that's burning really, really hot. Yeah, that would be like white hot. Okay. Yeah. Did you have another one? In welding? Okay, don't look at it though. <laughs> Through a mask or something, right? Yeah, pretty hot. Anybody else? Anyway, if you're around some things that are very hot, you can see white hot every now and then. Okay, so that's the solar radiation. Now, somebody says, uh, how do I go from Planck's distribution over to the Stefan Boltzmann law? Well, I'm glad you asked, because this is all of the wavelengths, isn't it? And this is at each individual wavelength. So guess what you're going to do? You're going to do a sum. You're going to do a little integral over all of the wavelengths from lambda. What's the smallest? I know we could go to 0.1, but these curves go off to down. You could start at zero. And I know that it's kind of the actions done by 100, but oh, go off to infinity. That makes a nice from zero to infinity with respect to lambda. What are you going to put in here? EB of lambda. And when you crunch through it, you should get up sigma t to the fourth. Well, okay. Um, so here are my constants, c1 and c2. They're down here. And it's just an exercise in integration to, to, to do that. Well, guess what? Um, I don't want to show you the integration. For some odd reason, I deleted it. But when I get hard pressed for an integral, I have to use some tool to help me. And when you use that tool to help you, you get a constant. And then when you finish off that integration, um, you can get the Stefan Boltzmann constant, sigma, from the Planck's distribution. All right, let's now talk about the Wien's displacement law. Notice that they put in here a dashed line. And that dashed line connects a series of points. What is it connecting? Uh, the point where the maximum of each of those temperature curves. So where does, where does the 300 Kelvin surface, where does it have the highest intensity of photons? At what wavelength? Well, it, it's, it's about this wavelength, right? What about this temperature? About that wavelength? Well, the Wien's displacement law. So 
what they did is they took the, the, the expression for E sub um, lambda B, they differentiated with respect to lambda, set that equal to zero. All they have to do is come, the mathematicians, come to this class, see how we use all the calculus, and they could make up all these great final exam problems for their Cal 1 and Cal 2 students. Don't you agree? Yeah, it's just now easy differentiation. Here's, here's the function. Go for it. Let's differentiate. All right? Aren't you glad that Wien did that? And now we can just say, oh, the result is that the maximum lambda multiplied by the surface temperature is equal to a constant 2898 micron Kelvin. So uh, somebody says, uh, what is the lambda max at 300 Kelvin? You just take 2898 micron Kelvin divided by the T, which is 300 Kelvin, and boom, you, it'll come in right close to 10, a little bit less than 10 microns. Somebody says, what's the maximum for the sun? Okay, put in 5800 Kelvin just using this equation, and you'll get about 0.5-ish, right around green. Green is 0.5-ish, maybe a little greater is green, color green in the spectrum. Okay, so that's Wien's displacement law. Also, what they're interested in, what, what I just did was I, I showed you a, a visual trick where you take the maximum drop by a decade cut in most of the actions between here and here for that line, right? Uh, but they, they have a, um, a, a tabulated the fraction of the emission that goes from zero up to the uh, a wavelength of interest. So uh, they found that this is a function of the lambda t. So once I pick the temperature of interest, and then I say, okay, I want to know how much is between lambda between zero micron and I don't know let's say t two let's not do two micron okay let's do let's do 300 Kelvin and let's do um, three micron okay so if it's 300 Kelvin and zero to three micron the product of lambda times T is going to be 900 micron Kelvin you come in there, you say, well, I wish he would have uh, given me a nice 900, and you would find that fraction, um, below, which is in that range from 0 to 3 micron, is very, very, very small. Okay, somebody says, okay, from 0 to, uh, to uh, 30 microns. Okay, well, what's the product of lambda t? That's going to be 9,000, true? So I come up here and I didn't copy 9,000 in. Okay, it will change the problem. Um, let's see, 100 micron. What is 100 times 300 Kelvin? 3, 0, 0, 0, 0. 30,000? Hey, that one's in. 0.99534. Essentially everything. What did you say that was? It's a fraction. It's the fraction uh, you integrate from zero to lambda of the E B lambda D lambda, and you divide it by to get the fraction sigma t to the fourth, the total emission. All right. Anyway, you can do band emission with that, and I covered all that. The last topic I want to get into, then we'll stop for today, is the t discussion of, of what happens to surfaces. If they're black, everything that impinges on it's absorbed. But if it's a real surface, it's not always absorbed. It can be transmitted. It can be absorbed. I'll show it like that. It can be reflected. And so the 100% uh, of what incoming has to be accounted for. And so if it's reflected, you have rho is uh, reflectivity, and that's some percentage of the incoming that's reflected. If it's absorbed, that's the absorptivity, and or it could be transmitted, that's the transmissivity.
So the sum of these three properties of a surface must be 100%. So it's simple what rho is, is what is the reflected divided by the total incident, likewise for the absorptivity and the transmissivity. If a surface is opaque, all right, what does that mean if you have an opaque surface? Expand your vocabulary here. Cannot see through it. So if you can't see through it, do you think the photons are going through it? No. So which one of these are zero for an opaque surface? The reflectivity, the absorptivity, or the transmissivity? Transmissivity. So a lot of surfaces, it's not transparent. I look around this room. There's a lot of non-transparent surfaces, right? And so it's often that one is equal to reflectivity plus absorptivity. So the reflectivity is one minus absorptivity. You just tell me what the absorptivity is, and I'll tell you what the reflectivity is for <coughs> opaque surfaces, vast majority. Well, there's a lot more to get to. But for today, we're going to go ahead and stop, and then next time we'll pick up with Kirchhoff's Law gray surfaces.